It is September 24th, 2020. This is Rook. There are those one in a million humans that defy categorization, artists or creators whose personality and contributions transcend borders, genres, and styles. Today we're joined by a man well known to many in the Iranian diaspora, let alone fans of dance and theater in France, the US, Iran, and beyond, but a man almost impossible to define. Iranian French theater star, dancer, and choreographer Shah Rukh Mushkin Ghalam grew up with creative talents that simply could not be contained in post revolutionary. Iran. He's made an international name for himself as one of the most fascinating and inventive artists around the world. Shah Rukh Mushkin Ghalam joins us today. I'm Gian Gameshi. This is Rukh. Hi there, welcome. Well, I got in there really quickly, didn't I? Yes. Wait. Okay, hi there. Welcome to episode number 47 of Rook. Omidvar hastam ke fantastic boshin. Shah Rukh Mushkin Kalam joining us from San Francisco in just a few minutes. Uh, you, I really don't know what this interview is going to be like. I know Shah Rukh. I don't know. It could be he he's a, always a surprise. Uh, we'll see where the interview goes. I'm looking forward to it. Um, lots of fabulous reaction to our uh, our Maximini episode from earlier this week. Lots of people still writing in about that and Farid Zolon from last week and the issues that came up with that interview. We're going to get to some of that mail today. Of course, the Rook Thursday team is here. Groovy Shaya. Hello. Jean. Salam. Salam. I, I um, feel like I have to speak to you in, far, in yes. Persian. Yeah. Um, what do you want me to say? Fantastic. Man, I'm ready for it. <laughs> Fantastic question. Captain Reza, hello. Hello, sir. How's the ship? The ship is in great shape. Uh, Shaya, can you turn Reza? Or, or, yeah, you want um, to. How, how has this mic? happened every <laughs> single week? <laughs> Reza, you, he, every single week I see Shaya motioning no. you to talk on the to microphone. Talk, I know, I know. All it's right. almost as if uh, it's rocket science or right. something. Okay. Talking to the microphone. The Not everyone's job. Hi, hi, Captain Reza. Hi. The fabulous Keon. Hi, Gian. Not so fabulous this week. What happened? A serious case of PMS, if you must know. Oh, boy. I know. Moving on. (laughs) You know what I was thinking? I was, how do female athletes get through it? Like, you should have asked, what's her name? Laurie? Farinaz Laurie. How she... Laurie Farinaz? Laurie Farinaz. Laurie Laurie Farinaz. You see, I don't even have a brain during this What's happening with you? It's that bad, huh? Like, once a month for Uh two or three days, I just, I am just the most miserable person on there. I appreciate how rook yeah. you're being about I'm this. I'm being yeah. very yeah. rook. This is a serious issue. Women, I'm sure, will appreciate okay. this. You should have a discussion about this. Sometime. Do you want to elaborate for we men? Are we are having a discussion. I mean, just, <laughs> just leave me in a room in my bed and throw chocolate at me. That's that's ice cream too. Ice cream uh, usually works. All right, we'll try and make this uh, easy for you. How was your? So besides this, I guess this is how your week has been. Yeah, this has been my week. <laughs> I've had to push all my plans to next week because okay. of this. Yeah. You know, I was going to tell you a couple of things. What were you going to tell One is, I went to the gym, our gym. I went wow. back to our gym. How was it? Well, I didn't see you. This week, you That's would not I, Now see I know me. why. Yeah. Uh, it was great. You were right. right? Yeah. It's, it's actually, I don't want there to be COVID, but I, I mean, I don't want this era. I want this to end. I want us to have freedom, no masks, all of that. But... It's actually kind of nice. Limited people in it's there. Halvat, it's halvat. You know, amazing. you've got you got you have access to whatever equipment you want to use. There's it's you know, wonderful, isn't it? Nobody talks to you. No, it's great. It's great. I yeah, know. Yeah. You made me miss it. Is her mic on? <laughs> Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, she's all, what's going on with you guys today? Everybody's talking <laughs> into you're just PMS. talking into the air. <laughs> no, but all right. no. Everybody well, I know what's going on with Kia. <laughs> yeah, we Everyone gotta learn to, to speak into the mic. Shia, please tell everybody to speak into the mic. Please. Right. Not an easy job, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh the other thing is I was gonna tell you, I don't think I've told any of you guys this. I was saving it. 
Um, ask me how a week my week was. How was your week, Jean? Uh, well, since I last saw you, had some weird moments. What kind of weird moments? Oh, funny you should ask. Uh huh. <laughs> So, <laughs> so uh, after the show last, so you know my my little son, my adorable uh, French bulldog, Oogie. I was just going to ask you have a son. No, <laughs> yeah, kind well, of love child? no, no, my dog, my oh, right, dog, yes, my your dog, dog yes, Oogie. Yes, uh, and you know Oogie comes with me everywhere. He yeah. comes to our studio. I mean, he's not in here right now because mm. uh, he would be. He might get uh, Mozahem inside <laughs> the studio, but he but he comes to uh, the the work offices everywhere I go. He's basically, so well behaved. Oogie has to uh, come with me. Uh, you know, it's single parent him. Yeah, he comes with me everywhere. So <laughs> last week, last Thursday, do you know the story, Reza? No, I don't. Okay. So last Thursday, I mean, it's not that big a deal, but uh, last Thursday we had a big show. We had the we mm. had the uh, Shachnish de Parsipur, we had Hadi Kalami, we had Cyrus Norstead. It was a three-hour show, uh, and we had the letters, all that stuff. So, so we were here, as you guys remember, till uh, I don't know, ten, eleven o'clock, and we've been here since early in the morning. This is last Thursday, and so uh, I, I'm exhausted. I'm going home. Uh, Ugi and I are going home. Uh, exhausted, and I, I may have, I can neither con- uh, confirm or deny, but I, I may have stopped at a fast food place on the way home. Which one? And, and gotten some pickup. Uh, uh, some, uh, which, which one? It, it, it may rhyme with, uh, <laughs> I may have stopped at a Scottish restaurant on the way home. <laughs> ah, does restaurant. it rhyme with Whack Donald's? It, it does rhyme with, w- <laughs> yes. It, that's, that's I, like I may have stopped the, the lowest the, point at, at in Mickey your life. D's. <laughs> I know. It doesn't, I know. Listen, I mean, you know, you can, so I so I buy my, yeah, that's right. I've got some McDonald's. <laughs> uh, you got your quarter pounder. I got my, uh, uh, and so, and mm. this it's like midnight. Mm. I'm exhausted. All I can think is I'm going to sit on my couch, you know, shamelessly eat this <laughs> McDonald's. Uh, I have probably have some, you know, uh, or something in the fridge that my mom has made me or like I, I made earlier in the week but I'm eating McDonald's you know yeah. I'm, uh, it's just uh, that long it's been that long a day and yeah. it's been and I just want to kind of catch up on the news of the day uh, and and eat and then go to bed and get up early and come back here right so so as we get uh, I get to my house and we get out and uh, Ugi there's a lane next to my house where Ugi at night uh, I take him for his so, so he can do his business, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, usually, I mean, if it's at like around midnight, I, you know, I don't really t- need to put him on a leash, as you say. He's a well-behaved he dog. Is. He's a couple years old, but he's already really, uh, you know, he's he's understands what, you know, he's got a sense of decorum about him, <laughs> little Oogie. So we go out in the lane, and before anything can happen, Oogie charges away from me. He starts oh, running. You know, God. he's seen something. And as just as I see where he's going towards the end of the lane, in, in kind of a, like you'd see in a TV show or in a movie, and in slow motion, I'm screaming, no, no. <laughs> and, and just then at the end of the lane, I see a giant skunk that Ugi is running towards. What is the, what's, uh, how do we say, Sage uh, Siosefid? <laughs> how do we say uh, skunk in? Rasu, I think. Rasu. Rasu Bumide. Yeah, Bumide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rasu. 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 So I see a Rasu. <laughs> <laughs> a huge, uh, oh, you know, the, it looked bird. like a really big skunk. And I see Oogie. Oh, no. You're charging. To, by the way, Oogie, this little 30 pound French bulldog, he, he, he goes, runs after everything. I, he has no idea what he would ever do if he catches them, right? <laughs> like, he, I, I don't know what he would do because he's not really that tough. Like, he thinks he's uh, tough. So, but he's running after the skunk. And just as I'm saying no, just as I, I see it and it's happening, it all happens like split second, uh, he gets to the skunk and the skunk zaps him, you know, sprays oh. him. And Oogie recoils backward, oh, like he f- oh, falls oh, back no. and he's sort of trying to grab his eyes <laughs> and he's rolling on the ground and the skunk runs away. Runs away and so then Oogie, uh, and I'm like, no, no. And, I'm, <laughs> and Oogie starts running back towards me. And then I start running away from Oogie, <laughs> oh, right? God. I don't want Oogie to catch me now. So yeah. then I run into the house and Oogie, <laughs> I close the door really quickly and Oogie comes up and Oogie's like looking at me oh. through the window, like let me in. Oh. And his oh, mouth is frothing and his oh, eyes are pu- bulging out. And he's been, you know, and I can smell through the door oh, that the, no. the sky. You know, the, the, the Rasu? Yep, Rasu. The, yeah. the smell of the Rasu. Uh, 
<laughs> Sorry, well, you love that word. Though, I, right? I would not expect it to be rasu. <laughs> yeah. That's why I think saga yeah, seal yeah. I was trying to think of what, uh, <laughs> what it's going to be, right? So very French. Uh, saga boo or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, the rasu. <laughs> so what did you I, do? I saw the rasu. It was uh, beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's a rossi. cafe. <laughs> uh, I have a muffin and some rasu. <laughs> yeah, so the rasu. Uh, so I, when a rasu first sprays the, 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 the French bulldog, it, it actually has a burning kind of smell. I don't know if you've ever smelled skunk. I try not to. Right when it happens, not in the aftermath. Yeah. Anyway, this has happened once before with Oogie. <laughs> so I, I, so I kind of knew what, where, what, what, what the next two hours were going to be for me. But, oh but I was so angry. Also, my McDonald's bag <laughs> is sitting outside the door on the porch next to Oogie. So, like, that's a write-off, oh, you know, because now he's yeah. covered you the McDonald's. You see that? That's how the universe works. You buy McDonald's. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> this is what happens. So, so uh, I was so upset, you know. I was. I went through this kind of complete I, I went through the complete history of oogie like you know getting him as a baby like, like i'm like why do i have this dog you know it's it's midnight i've worked for 12 hours i i, I just want to eat my mcdonald's <laughs> and go to bed now the rasu has <laughs> attacked oogie <laughs> So you left him out there so, for two so hours? So no, no, I didn't leave. Well, that would see. That's not even an option because Oogie can't fend for himself. I can't. You know, part of me was just like, I'm just going to leave him out all night. But you know, he'd be like, How do I? I mean, this is a Think dog that. What you've done. This is ostensibly a tough dog that eats a a vet prescribed gastrointestinal <laughs> intestinal organic food. Like he's a luxury dog, Aww. right? He doesn't know what to do out there. You know, so. So sure enough, like after I get over my upset, you know, uh, and my recounting the decisions I've made in my life, like like getting Oogie, I, I, I resign myself to the next two. So I take off all my clothes because you have to be completely oh naked, God. you know. Tomato I, juice? I play, I, I, fortunately, I had this huge like this huge bottle of tomato paste in, in the uh, fridge, which was a really lousy tomato paste that I'd used like a little bit of for a pasta, you know, a month ago or something. And I, I'd actually been eyeing it for the last few weeks thinking, I gotta throw that out. Why am I keeping uh, that? Well, now I know why I was keeping perfect. it. So I mixed up that with a bunch of water. I also got some vinegar, you know, oh. I sprang into action with it. <laughs> but but the indignity of, you know, taking, getting naked, <laughs> scooping up Oogie, running, you know, so that the, the boo of the raw soup who doesn't get it throughout the house and then running to the the shower and then for the next half an hour covering oogie and of course myself in tomato <laughs> juice oh, dear, uh, and then vinegar you know and, and and oogie of course hates it he's like looking at me like that why <laughs> what happened to me with the rasu and now i've got tomato juice and then you know dogs like every every moment that i can't hold him tight he does the shake like the yeah. dog shake yeah. so then tomato juice is everywhere oh. like it looks like oh. blood all over the yeah, you know blue, shower and it, what a yeah. poetic end to your Thursday it's that's right almost and beautiful <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then I, I used his shampoo I, but they, actually it worked I mean I got you know tomato paste is that the tomato the, tomato juice to yeah tomato hmm. juice but you gotta you rub it in and then I used the vinegar I mean it sounds horrible but it does. but so is the skunk smell right they, let me tell you, a rasu. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, huh. I mean, that's it's not more. how it sounds. That's for yeah. sure. The sago cf sefid. Um, so uh, yeah, that was my that was my that was the be- that was the last time you saw me, Keon. Yeah. That's what happened that wow, night. Wow, that is yeah. epic. One can only wonder what will happen tonight. <laughs> When I come I home with Ugi, I hope you can top that. If there's another Rasu, that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, do they have Rasus, by the way? In uh, when you were growing up, no, no, they don't have that. Really, now. really, yeah, they, yeah. They didn't make they that. See, or you rarely see or any sand. We don't have sand job raccoons. either. No, we don't, don't have sand job. Or, or raccoon. Sand job is a squirrel. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that. Remember that. What's a raccoon in Farsi? A raccoon. 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 Oh, that's Ra- disappointing. Raccoon. 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 That's so interesting. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. They, yeah. That's so. So, did you? Sorry, this is. I mean, did you know what a skunk was of growing course. up? Yes. Yeah. But even though there wasn't, like, so, but you don't have them in Iran. But you would see 
Pepe Le Pew Actually, or something. Actually, about Rosu, I'm not sure. I think in the north of Iran, we have Rosu. In nor- I, I northern Iran? Because so, yeah, yeah, yeah. ge- it has to do with the ge- geographic of the place. Like, it's very climate dependent. Depen- hmm. Like, the, the, the animals you mean that hot grow. climates, the skunk doesn't... Uh, uh, cold climate. Skunks and... Uh, um, what you want to call it? Uh, are from Do you need a coffee, Captain Reza? No, no, no. Speaking no. very slowly. <laughs> <laughs> well, in cold climates, what? Cold they climates. don't? Yeah, no, they do. They do grow in they cold climates. They grow in cold yeah. climates. Yeah, I yeah, see. Yeah. So Not you're saying in, in, in Iran. Right. In, uh, so that's what Shai says, cold, maybe too. northern Iran. Okay, mm. I see. Maybe some. Right. But I, I didn't know the skunks were I guess the cartoons kind of... Yes. Showed you what yeah. skunk fr- was. That's what I'm saying, Pepe Le Pew. Yeah, yeah he's the French Pepe skunk. Le Pew. For me, yeah. I, yeah. I grew yeah. up in the Middle East for the first chunk of my childhood. No, but you and the well, first time I saw a raccoon was in Pocahontas. So I was like, oh, this adorable creature. And then the first time we went to Vancouver, a group of raccoons <laughs> no, came. Well, so we were feeding them, and all the can, the white people were like, no, get away, get away. <laughs> no, of course so you do what it is. It's like knowing what a giraffe is or a, or a I don't know, a crocodile. You get it all from like, cartoons, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you get yeah. it from cartoons. That's from books yeah. I mean I guess we should get to our guests <laughs> uh, or is the show over it's a oh, long show uh, by the way Arash Behzadi Iranian Canadian artist musician entrepreneur this is a guy who grew up in Iran came to Canada in the 1990s as a young man uh, and he is uh, one of the people helping support this program uh, and, and this episode in particular. He actually wanted to support the Shah Rukh Moshkin Kalam uh, episode. Uh, artists supporting each other. You gotta love that. Arash has uh, an entrepreneurial business side. He built a business from scratch that's very successful in Canada in the quality control and healthcare industries and has a team that he's built in Canada, the US, Dubai, and sells worldwide. But. You may know Arash Behzadi as a piano player, as a musician, as a pianist. He's played piano for 30 years and more seriously in the last 10 years recording and composing and collaborating with other artists. He's also a yogi and has practiced yoga for many years. And this is where the worlds have collided for Arash. He feels piano music can make yoga practice go deeper, the soul and vibrations of the music. So he's pioneered something called piano yoga, in which he plays uh, intuitive piano. We talked about this before, mm-hmm. Keon. You've, yeah. you've done this. You've done I one have. of his sessions. Uh, it's all about improvisation and energy. During yeah. yoga classes and festivals around the world, he provides the music and you do the yoga, right? Yeah, it just it, it just captures your spirit. And I, 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 it's hard to put it into words, but I could use some of that right now. It's some a lot of better that, than like, a Rasu. <laughs> yeah, oh, Rousseau? He's what was it? Rasu. Rasu. Yeah, yeah. yeah. His uh, music really touches your soul. And like, I, it's very rare for music to do that to, to me. So. Arash Behzadi, so he's done this piano yoga in Bali, in Dubai, in Canada, in Turkey, in Italy. He also has recordings, of course, he's got a few albums. You can find him on Instagram at Arash Piano, Arash Piano on Instagram. Thank you to, so much to uh, Arash Behzadi for his support for this episode. Okay, so we, as I mentioned, we've got a bunch of letters, Keon, with uh, Yes, we, we will actually, get Actually, we, we have a bunch uh, we had Max Amini on the show on Monday and got so much lovely reaction to that. Uh, but I think we're going to wait because we've still got a bunch of Farid Zolan yeah, mail to yeah, go through. Yeah, yeah, we have right? a lot to get to. Okay, yeah. so we'll get to the letters of the week. We'll get to lots more. Captain Reza, Gruby Shaya, Fabulous Keon. See you in a few moments. Let me get to our featured guest today. How do I effectively and elegantly try to introduce a man who may not even be human, a bearded butterfly, a devilish dervish, a modern dancer who can tread on clouds or thump on stone. If you've read or seen Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, you'll be aware of a protagonist named Puck, a mischievous fairy, a sprite, or a gesture who can influence much of what is around him. And perhaps that is a fair metaphor or image for our guest today. Shah Rukh Mushkin Kalam is an Iranian-French actor, dancer, choreographer, and director who is impossible to forget once you've seen him perform. He was born in Iran and moved at an early age with his family to Paris, where he spent his formative years. Shah Rukh was always attracted to theater and dance and ended up graduating with a degree in art and theater from Paris 8 University. He went on to be an actor for many Many years in the prestigious Comédie Française troupe. Uh, this is the very famous troupe, and he was the first Iranian to be part of Comédie Française. He also went on to found and direct the Nakisa Art Company. 
As a dancer, Shah Rukh specializes in Middle Eastern folklore and mystical dance and has a deep interest in Indian, Indonesian, and flamenco dances. But uh, frankly, if you've seen him move, he can kind of do it all, including Amin Baba Karam. He, he has performed all over the world as a dancer and an actor and has done so to much acclaim and recognition. Shah Rukh Mushkin Galam has been based in California now for a few years and continues to perform globally and work with the Nakisa Art Company. Nakisa Art houses dancers and actors from Iran and other countries and with performances all over the world. The work of Nakisa Art is an association between the classical technique and contemporary spirit, which is very well suited to retelling classic tales. Shah Rukh is the spirit behind it all. And right now, Shah Rukh Mushkin Galam joins me from San Francisco today. Hello, sir. Good job, John. You're a good seller. I will give you a huge tip. <laughs> I think you deserve a, a big introduction like that. Oh, I don't know if I deserve, but that was nice. Actually, that uh, like, you know, uh, we call this uh, rassasiement. Rassasier is a French word coming from Latin. And that's when you have the perfect enough food of the spirit. And you gave me as much as my selfishness needed to have per day. Ah, oh, you're very kind. Well, I'm glad you got your appropriate amount of food, of feeding th through your introduction. I'm so happy to finally have you on the program. We've been trying to do this. How are you doing? I know California has been beset by a state of COVID, and now there's these fires, and there's an election coming up. There's so much going on in where you're located. How, how are you doing over there? Oh, you know, I'm asthmatic and I have lots of issue with my lungs and I have always been very afraid about being suffocated uh, physically or mentally. That's why I uh, do choose my first exile when I was teenage because I couldn't be suffocated under a, a, a dictatorship. And now I have another type of that kind of suffocation. I can't take my breath uh, easily because there is fire and smoke everywhere in California. Sometimes you uh, uh, wake up in the morning and you do believe it's not day yet or it's a day on the planet Mars mm -hmm. because yeah. everywhere is like orange and you can't go anywhere because everywhere is closed and COVID-19 uh, apocalyptic now. So here you are now, ostensibly in the land of the free in California, and you're you're feeling imprisoned. It, it, it's so interesting to hear you use the idea of suffocation as a metaphor for what you can and cannot handle, and the life you want to live. And I, I think you told me this before: the fact that you're an asthmatic is also fascinating, uh, given that your life work has been so physical and so much about endurance and strength in terms of what you're doing on stage. It's, it's quite curious that you actually have lung issues. Yeah, it's strange and so interesting because the lungs is the, the last organ which is made before uh, getting birth. And it was a prematurated seven months I get out oh. uh, and why that's why my lungs uh, has so much issues and uh, my asthma is coming from that origin of course and uh, I knew that but so I had to choose my job not because of my handicap because of my capacity and of course my capacity is more than just the needs of my lungs you know uh, perfectly you mentioned it endurance that means i can't go over one hour huge effort i can die after so during one hour i do all my best on the stage that's why all my uh, creation of dance performance are around the one hour no more i can't be on the stage more than one hour but what you do is so athletic it's so interesting yeah, to me, is. and you see, and obviously it's so smooth. You're doing this sometimes mystical, sometimes very animated kind of work. So are we to believe then that before you do a performance, you're backstage sucking on a puffer, you know, like a Ventolin uh, asthma puffer <laughs> or something? 
not not before, but most of the time right after, because uh, the crisis of asthma is coming uh, partly from effort. When you do lots of effort yes. or lots of emotion or lots of dust or allergic uh, situation, you can pr- uh, have this crisis. So after my performance, I will uh, sometimes need a Vansodin inspiration but uh, not never before and hopefully never before because that change your uh, physical compartment have you ever had to uh, again it's oh, so interesting to me because anybody who knows you will think of you as so robust you know it's um it's it's always um uh, interesting to find out that the person who's in that robust shell um can can be um fallible can have issues like the rest of us like me i also have uh, asthma uh, have you ever had to cancel a performance or stop in the middle because you were out of breath or having lung issues <laughs> i had a funny uh, experience because that was one of the first time i i did the experience of weed marijuana and so as i never smoked in my whole life even a cigarette uh, and uh, i discovered at age of 47 the marijuana recently that, recently you discovered weed yeah i, I discovered it very late very very late uh-huh. so I, I i did a very uh, you know healthy life uh, like till age of 40 i never touched any kind of alcohol even fantastic french wine i i couldn't because that couldn't help me for my body for a dancer a performer but at age of uh, 47 i discovered weed and as that has so much impact in my capacity of hearing the music uh, i would love to have an experience with weed during my performance so for one performance in london that was uh, like four or five years ago for um, a fantastic program for no rules you know and <laughs> and of course i had immediate asthma crisis and i couldn't get on the stage and and as you know perfectly the time changed the, the density and the and the time was very short for me waiting for my crisis passing and when i get on the stage and that was already too late because i stayed <laughs> one hour behind the curtain. <laughs> everybody's gone uh, home <laughs> yeah almost, almost almost i uh f up at the show uh, yeah, so, and, so, so and the problem the, nice. the problem wasn't that you were too high. The problem was that it affected your lungs that you you, you couldn't you yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I guess I guess that I, I, had, I had the crisis of cough. Yeah, I had a cough <laughs> crisis and that couldn't pass easily and uh, I had to just calm down and do some meditation like uh, respiration, like uh, we pass uh, like um, pranayama. Uh, respiration uh, exercise but I did like few uh, pranayama that should be normally two or three minutes but I realized I had passed like more than 45 minutes what's amazing about you though is and I, I know anyone who's ever met you will know exactly what I'm talking about those who don't who've never seen you perform, who don't even know who you are, uh, who might be listening right now, may not understand this. But you're the kind of person that I'm sure people have said to you before, they think that you're always using drugs because you're such a, a big personality. You've got so much and you've got these wild ideas and you're highly creative and you're so animated. You're like a character, you know? Um, so I, I would guess that people would be very surprised when they find out that you've lived a very clean lifestyle. Yes? Yeah. Most of the time when I was in a discotheque on a, or uh, some uh, dancing night, Everybody who came to me to ask me, what did you use? <laughs> like, please give us some of yours. <laughs> I said, no, no. I, 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 I even drink uh, like beer. I, I never had a, any kind of uh, drinks, alcohol, drugs, nothing in a discotheque. And I was so high, high of the music. The music is my the only element coming from exterior of my body, which can make me crazy completely completely is music Mm. i don't need more drugs than music music and poetry persian poetry and music can make me cry die 
of joy, of ex uh, being so excited I can have a, a half practice, you know, a crisis, heart attack. I can have a heart attack just hearing the music. I love that. And I love that you, you don't need anything. You've got this natural high. I mean, it's, it's infectious when one is around you. Um, let's come back to what you've been doing recently, but let me define some terms, if you can, of, of, of your craft. Uh, and because I was thinking about even how to describe, I mean, I did that introduction where I'm, <laughs> I'm giving, uh, talking about you as a sprite and this, uh, this whirling dervish and all these things, but it feels limiting to just call you a dancer or even a choreographer. It seems like you're somehow doing so much more on stage than just dancing. How do you describe what it is that you do? Art. That is art. Uh, visual art. Actually, is visual art. Yes, a big and uh, I uh, do exchange of emotions and beauty with my audience, with the uh, images, and also with the sound, with the poetry. The poetry could be used as a music background, and me being in performance as a dancer, or I can be a narrator of a poetry or doing some beautiful sentences of Shakespeare translated by another po fantastic Persian poet like Iraj Mirza. And I did the performance as an actor and I was the goddess of love, mm -hmm. Venus. Yes. I played that. That was a performance of theater. So I, I, I had the biggest background of actor in France than dancer but for the uh, persian community they know me mostly by dance because they are not fan of theater that's why they don't know uh, so much about my theater background let me take what you've said one one step at a time because there's a lot of interesting things you've just said there first of all uh, the the notion of dance is is particularly interesting because with acting you are using words and you so so communicating the poetry is understandable when you talk about dance it, it's the, the most interesting thing to me about what you do is that Persian culture is so rich as you've as you've intimated as you've indicated here uh, when it comes to the written word that legacy of poetry and romantic scripts so rich that it almost seems audacious to think that you could communicate that poetry that legacy in a physical way when did you start thinking or knowing that you could come up with dance programs or physical moves that would communicate poetry i was watching when i was uh, very young i was watching people who use so much their hands like italian people when they're talking and their body the expression of their face eyes mouth all the muscles of the face and neck and the body is yes. moving and accompanying so much more powerful when they're talking like a dictator like uh, Mussolini or even Hitler or uh, actors like Charlie Chaplin when I was watching them uh, doing uh, they could talk without any words by their body language and body language became so much important for me. And dance was one of the characters, especially uh, like uh, the Indian dance, uh, which is full of uh, uh, ideogram. And they can talk with mudras by hands, like uh, this, uh, this sign language. They can use the body as a language. That's the fantastic way of communication. I love it. But what are the mechanics of that? If I were to say to you, Shah Rukh, we want you to do, I mean, I don't know if you do it this way, but to be commissioned to do something. But if I were to say to you, we want you to do a, per a performance at, you know, this at this place in London, this big famous opera hall, and we we're going we're to get you to dance, and, and we want you to use a piece of Hafez poetry. Where would you start in terms of figuring out how you want to uh, physically manipulate yourself, how you want to present poetry without words physically? I mean, I know a song songwriter would sit at a piano and start playing notes on the piano and see what comes to them. How do you do it? Do you recite the poetry in your head? Do you just think about it and, and your body moves in some direction? What is the way you create that? 
That could be all of this. Uh, you have so many ideas. I could pick any of your ideas and realize it. I use the hermetic way because Hermes is the god of the transportation of the mind, the philosophy of the god and goddess to the human. That's why a, a poet a reader should be the perfect hermetic person who can transport the meaning from the base, from the origin of the creation of the poem to the audience to who can hear it. So the dancer is doing exactly the same way. If your deep understanding of poem is uh, done, you can, and if you have the capacity to transport this meaning to your audience, you can do it in any way without poem reading, without music, just with your body language, that could be any of uh, this uh, possibility. When you're using your body language, do you want, uh, how do you feel about people knowing the words? When I started going to see the ballet, this is, you know, as a younger person when I was in my 20s, the first couple of times I sort of thought, well, what, are, what is it they're doing? I mean, it's pretty and I like it. And then, and then somebody <laughs> said, somebody said, well, you can read the libretto. And, you know, for me, reading the libretto, like, under, you know, the story I'm reading along to as I watch it was actually very helpful, but I don't know if that would be cheating or not. I mean, would you prefer somebody know the exact words that you're, that you're dancing to, or do you want them to just feel the emotion, as you called it, of, of what's happening uh, in your body? Both ex experiences. I had uh, the experience to do the uh, subtitle during my performance of uh, Persian poetry, like Omar Khayyam, uh, for my audience in France, uh, who could be lost to hearing Omar Khayyam uh, quatrain and uh, watching me moving. So they will be frustrated to don't understand. But I did the experience without subtitle. And strangely, most of the French audience who came to me after the show and giving me uh, the feedback of what they felt during my performance without knowing at all what is the meaning of the quatrain of Omar Khayyam, where I was dancing on, most of the time that was much more close to my meaning of uh, the interpretation. Right. And they, they catch that. That's why I call it the international language. Body language is international language. For a language like English or French or Persian or whatever language, you have to know, you have to have the knowledge of this language. But if you don't have, you have one for free is the body language. And it's much more touchable for everybody, every human, every sapiens on the earth can understand it much easier without knowing a word of your culture language. So that's, I mean, this is very interesting. You know, a few moments ago, I asked you how you describe what you do. And you said, the first, one of the first things you said is, um, I think you said an exchange of emotions when you're performing uh, with the audience. And the implication of an exchange is that you're not just performing for the audience or, or inspiring emotions in them, but you're playing off the emotions of the audience too. Yes, exactly, so exactly. It's an exchange, exchange of the uh, emotion. That's why we call it live performance. And so much different than when you see a live performance and when you see it in YouTube. In YouTube, you don't have any emotion. The emotion is only yours. You cannot share my emotion with, with your emotion and to make another one, a, a new one. But so by implication, what you're saying is that with each different audience, your performance becomes somewhat different because you're, you're playing off of the energy of what you're receiving from the people in front of you, right? Exactly. You are 100% right. And you are describing this so, so perfectly. You could be exactly in my mind and talking for me. <laughs> but then the, that also means that there are are going to be some performances where if the audience is giving you no energy, you're what? You're going, you're, you're going yes. through the motions. Unfortunately, yeah, I, unfortunately, I had that experience too, to being like in the coldest uh, <laughs> ambience in my 
whole life and uh, is ha having this uh, very bad energy. I don't like to talk about that, but maybe once in my whole life, I had that very bad experience that was in London, in Covent Garden, one of the most beautiful uh, space, nice. uh, a venue for performer, uh, which is a dream for any performer to, to perform in Covent Garden Royal what Opera House in London. Uh, the, the audience was like uh, a, a refrigeration. <laughs> it, it, that was the frigid, the most frigid uh, audience I had in my whole life. And I was sick as well. Uh, I, that was a, a package of the bad uh, things, right, bad right, elements right. <laughs> all together. Several times during my performance, I thought, they are dying. <laughs> they are not alive. <laughs> because there was any reaction, like there was, uh, I don't know, that was the coldest audience I never had in my whole <laughs> right, life. Right, right. I was afraid about them. I couldn't dance. <laughs> I couldn't move on the stage. I don't know. Something was wrong. Maybe that was, I was not in my best shape because I had uh, <laughs> broken my leg like three months um, before. And that was my first performance after three months. Maybe I was afraid my body was uh, still uh, traumatized uh, uh, by the accident. What year was this? And how, how long ago was this? That, that was in 2000 or 1999. Uh, 1999, uh, 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 most yeah. probably, yeah. And if you, if the emotions of the audience are so important to you and in turn, so important to what you're doing, that live performance energy that you get, then I would suspect it's harder for you to be on film. Or I mean, you've appeared in a lot of videos and and uh, and actually quite famous um, film moments and 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 videos of famous artists. And is that harder for you to do then because you don't have the audience to play off of? You know, I, I was, uh, I grew up in the live performance with Ariane Nushkin in Théâtre du Soleil, which is one of the most important company of theater company in, in the, the world. Uh, and it's based in France. And Ariane, she is a, a huge lady of theater. Everybody knows, I know. And, and I grew up with her during the six, seven years. And I, I was made with the worst possibility of being on the stage for live performance with accidents with uh, e e every kind of accidents I had uh, during my experience with Adrian Mushkin on the stage and so nothing else can afraid me to be on stage right. and right. having troubles right and it's it's kind of exciting even that, I that is that i mean that's like doing a live broadcast too it's like this the interview being live any anything can happen and that's what the audience is is excited about right i mean uh, it, uh, absolutely and i am also excited because the excitement of the audience i can feel it yeah they know how fragile i am and i know how fragile is the situation everything could be just broke down in a second with just stupid accent so then if 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 nam ju says can you dance in my video do you are you up for it or do you feel like oh this is not going to be as as i'm not going to have the same energy as i would in a in a live performance uh i think we had a, a disconnection of internet ah. during your question my, my, qu so, my, my question was, and, and, and what is your next question? <laughs> I understand. I, <laughs> I think love I, when you which, laugh. Which part of which laugh. part of that question did you not like? Was it the Namju part or the doing a video part? I I'm sorry, uh, you were cut again. Ah. Could you just pass to next question? <laughs> uh, you know, some of what you do feels quite mystical now don't make fun of me or think me silly for asking this but uh, because i'm not actually being facetious but i think about you having seen you in performance do you sometimes regret that you are human and uh, because i think of of the characters you become for example in khala suske uh, and i think it is so outer worldly sometimes what you are able to do and how you transform yourself and i think this guy would you 
would you prefer to be an animal or some kind of energy being that could fly or stretch into space? A serious question. <laughs> you know, when you, you start the, your uh, interview with me, a crow come to the window where, where I am sitting in California and everywhere is orange because of the weather. And uh, I have my filter in it, in this uh, apartment. And I was watching this crow and I realized if there is a, an animal I would love to be, that could be this crow. Uh, I love this uh, bird. So intelligent, so beautiful. And especially his beauty is not visible for everybody. And his beautiful voice and song is not audible for everybody. That's why he is free. Mm. And the freedom is the most beautiful thing I can I wish for human and for animals as well. I'm so sad about, uh, you know, uh, the beautiful little birds, parrots, because they are in the cages. And I don't want to be in cage, animal, pet, bird, or whatever, in an aquarium, a, a beautiful fish, or a human in a prison. I would love to be free as an animal. Maybe the crow is one of the most, uh, the freest uh, and uh, the luckiest animal. This is a... This is a theme with you, this notion of of rebelling against or, or having a, an extreme reaction, dis distaste for anything that feels suffocating. And yeah, so absolutely. so the crow can transcend that. I, I It's a very beautiful image. It, 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 you, a crow really came to your window as I was doing the... the yeah, 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 yeah. I took pictures. I can send it to you right now. No, you should be. I, you should have been anticipating doing an amazing interview. What were you doing, taking pictures of crows? As I was do, doing my, you know, what sweat I put into that introduction for you. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I love your. I love the the description of the crow. So the answer is that you you do sometimes regret being human. You you want to be. You do have that spirit. That's what I suspected. Uh, Tell me, Shahrukh, we've talked about, I've talked, I've asked you about, about this physical performance of what you do, you know, your dance, your, your physical expression, et cetera. Tell me about working with words, on the other hand, and in particular, sometimes with words that are not French or Farsi. When you were doing Antigone in New York in 2017, uh, you were acting in English. How was that for you? Oh, uh, you know, when I start to perform in France, that was, of course, in French language. And my director, Alain Mishkin, she tried to make me understand. You can sometimes go to your uh, mother language, like Persian, and uh, try to find the, the real profound uh, emotion coming from this word in your origin language and whatever. That was a way. Maybe she was right for that time, for 30 years ago. Then, when you are out of your country, out of your uh, language, and you're just having different uh, emotional relationship with your lovers from other countries, and you, and you exchange uh, sentences in another language, like in Italian, I had Italian lovers, or Spanish, I had so many Spanish lovers, or uh, in English, or in French, or in Persian, or Arabic. Whatever is the language of love, and immediately your whole body, physicality, change uh, the position of being uh, touchable with this a new uh, foreigner language. Oh. When, when I hear now, mon amour, my body is shaking. When I hear the mo, my love, it's doing the same way, shaking my body and m that make uh, my face, my neck wet to hear Amor mio, uh, it is the same way. 
uh, you know, there is no more barrier. There is no more frontier because you touch the meaning of words. So in the end, when you did this, because uh, it was quite a big show, it got a lot of attention. When you did this run in, in New York in 2017 in English, how did you feel about it? That was uh, a new experience for me. But that was because especially that was in New York in Broadway shows and yes. lots of uh, different audience, so very specific uh, professional audience were there. Never somebody came to me to say, I couldn't understand you. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was touched because uh, there is a lot more uh, than just the barrier and uh, the impact and uh, the the frontier of languages. What about off stage? Do you feel? I mean, do you right now? Do you feel like a different person speaking in English to me doing this interview than if we were doing it in French or doing it in Farsi? Of course. Because I can't develop my mind in the same way when I'm talking in the Farsi and when I'm talking in English. Well, I get Farsi happy as I get Farsi happy as I'm Kiasti. Oh, I get Farsi happy as I'm nobody will understand. Anymore. So that so one thing is for sure you're a lot faster in Farsi. You speak quite quick quickly. It's a different pace. You have a different pace of of being in Farsi than in English. Maybe I like I like you in English because it slows you down. I can catch you. I can catch you. Normally I can't catch you. You're running too quickly. Yeah, it's true because most of the people who when I'm talking Persian who's uh, reacting they, they are like lost because <laughs> I'm going too fast. <laughs> even Persians, yeah. even Persians are oh, lost. Oh, mo mostly Persian, yeah. Uh, most of the time I'm asking uh, several times during my conversation, mo my monologue, uh, I'm asking, do you understand me? Do you understand? Do you understand what I mean? And most of the time they are lost because I'm talking too much and too fast for them. So, so you said earlier that, um, yeah, I mean, as an aside, you said, you know, because Persians are not fans of theater. Iranians are not fans of theater. Less, what, what, less fans. Less of fans of theater. Than, uh, why do you, why than, do you think that is? We just don't have the same tradition of it? Oh, because it's very new in, in Iran that came at the end of the Pahlavi's regime and they start to understand the uh, theater, European style, intellectual people, uh, the writer, artist, uh, they start to understand, and that was cut suddenly by uh, Mullah's regime uh, after the revolution uh, in uh, 79. And so they had like maximum two, 20 years of experience of theater. And then, of course, it's another word now in Iran, the word of theater is completely crazy i i don't know it very well but specifically for the diaspora persian diaspora uh, what is my frequentation because i don't know about the iranian people uh, audience how they can react to my uh, place because i never had that experience wait a to second. play in iran wait, wait, wait a second so, wait wait a second uh, and i know you know about this uh, you're schooled on the history of theater so I, I trust you are you saying that in the first half of the 20th century like reza shah period etc there was no uh theater in iran not at all we had just one kind of theater which is tazia which is like uh a traditional um, religious uh, ceremony and they are doing several uh, very uh, ridiculous shows which is very funny and they do it so seriously they are crying because of the uh, death of uh, 
uh, one of the imam or prophet, I don't remember exactly who was getting injured by uh, the enemy during a fight. So, uh, and they are doing tazia, and tazia is the, the most, the oldest, the most famous kind of theater in Iran, which is practicing still now. Uh, and that was the oldest. During the and uh, right after the Reza Shah, the son who was uh, well educated, very uh, European style in Switzerland, and he came in Iran with his wife Farah Tiba, who was a student of art in Paris. So they loved art and they promote art and every kind of art, modern art, European like uh, Western art in Iran. And then they introduced during the reign, uh, the regime of Pahlavi, the second Pahlavi, suddenly we had every kind of art, especially uh, theater, came to Iran. And then they grew, that grew like a mushrooms yes. everywhere in every kind. And so we have tons of, fantastic artists of theater now but unfortunately i didn't have that chance to be in the country after the revolution i left iran and my audience is specifically the audience of the diaspora which is very particular so i want to ask I'm you about this i want to ask you about this first of all that that is a very interesting thank you for that little history lesson because it's i mean we don't think of in the west as, as a kid who grew up in the West, despite being an Iranian kid, uh, I don't think of theater as an uh, as a new form. <laughs> you know, I think of it as in fact. In fact, I think of it as quite traditional, quite old. One thinks of Shakespeare. You know, one thinks of a uh, uh, centuries yeah. past. So to hear that yeah. it's a relatively new art form, and I know that it's exploding in in Tehran right now. Theater is a is very popular. Uh, it's that that is very very interesting. It's, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, and and you know, for the audience, uh, you, you, I mean, for my audience, my Persian audience in diaspora, the need of uh, art is not the same uh, in Iran because they are mostly uh, going for being entertained uh, in uh, for the diaspora, and they are not going to be informed about uh -huh. knowledge. But was it, wasn't there, Shah Rukh, wasn't there a, a vaudevillian kind of, uh, sorry to cut you off, but a vaudevillian kind of street, what would the guys, the names of those guys who do the Shah Nameh on the street, the um, Nagali, Nagali. Nagali. That's, yeah, a, Nagali, that's a kind of theater, I guess, right? That they were, like a yeah, street theater. Yeah, na narration, yeah, narration could be like, uh, considered like kind of theater or life art. Uh, but, so we are when we are specifically talking about theater. So, right, right, right. Uh, yeah, you know what I'm doing. I'm not doing narration uh, or nakali on the street. Uh, and uh, the street art is a very hard and particular art. I had two or three times the experience, and that was the worst experience <laughs> in my life because I can't. I can be concentrated on stage when the audience is not concentrated right, right. Uh, on, yeah, on me. Yeah, the, yeah. And it's very difficult. I don't understand how they can do it. The performance, the performer on the street, they are doing the, the worst job, the most difficult. You know, that's how I started, right? I started. Oh, really? Yeah, I, in my in my band, oh, my, my band God. in the nineteen nineties. We were actually theater school kids, and we we did uh, we started uh, by doing street theater. We would do and and singing and performing kind of guerrilla theater on the streets. And you're right. It's, so you it, know, you in know fact, what, what in I fact, mean, we did it in uh, Covent you know Garden. I mean. We did it in Covent yeah. Garden and had, had the same reaction. Oh, uh, that you're, yeah, you're, uh, but but it's still still very difficult. Yeah, because it's not the same concentration. It's so impossible. I, yeah, it's I, very hard. Yeah, it's very and hard. I. I I don't do this. I can't do this. Sean, yeah. let me ask you how how then with that backdrop of of these arts being relatively new that you became who you you are uh, and you've still you've told the story in little bits and pieces in different places but but just to get it on the right you so you were born in Iran and and as the story goes 
you were nomadic. You moved a lot uh, as a kid because you were in a military family. Um, what what do you remember about being a kid in Iran? Oh my gosh, it's like not like uh, four years ago. It's like yesterday. I remember so clearly about situations of any ages. I remember very clearly uh, like like a huge movie, uh, the experiences of my uh, age of three, four, five, six, seven. Every step of ages, I remember very clearly uh, the, the beautiful and dramatic and powerful moment of my life. I remember, I, I don't forget uh, anything, unfortunately. Maybe my memory is... Uh, really not a uh, fish memory and uh, i remember as an elephant very um, uh, very deeply all the sad moment of my life and delicious moment of my life i remember and uh, when you think about if i say shah Rukh at four years old i mean because you were a little kid before the revolution let's be you know you know you weren't that that old would it be a fond time do you have fond memories of that time yeah, that was interesting because I was in Isfahan, one of the most beautiful city in the world, uh, as you know. Isfahan is the capital of the uh, Safavid dynasty mostly, and, and uh, it is so beautiful. And I grew up uh, all my childhood till age of nine I was in Isfahan, and that's my most beautiful, beautiful images of Iran uh, during my childhood were you a happy kid i can consider myself like a happy human then yeah uh, i even uh, if i choose like a uh, my life was turned to drama because of my dramatic arts was my study in university and my choose of life but drama uh, i'm happy with drama this is not the, the most of the people uh, think uh, drama uh, is sad drama is not sad drama you can enjoy drama i it's love sad, uh, i'm a yeah. drama queen myself i got gotcha. you it it almost seems like a story of myth you know because the story they what what people always say about you when i watched you in these other interviews and everything is that he started to dance at 3 years old is that really true i mean where what what kind of dance were you doing when you were 3 years old you know, my father, he was a, a fantastic artist and beautiful soul, so artistic, so delicate, so fragile, so vulnerable. And uh, he loved music and poetry and literature and he was friend with lots of very famous artists in Iran. And I was always surrounded by the friends of my father and they loved music they had always a performer uh, in between them and they were singing and playing asking me to move and dance with them at the age of three it's the, one of maybe oldest uh, memory of my performances uh, several times the people told me uh we saw you when you were three years <laughs> in this uh huge hotel in Esfahan, Hotel Paul, you were performing on the stage and I was dancing for 15 minutes and everybody was clapping hands and, uh -huh. and uh, yeah, I, I, I started to, to perform on being on the stage really at the age of three and that's why stage is my, my, maybe my real home, the most frequented uh, space mm -hmm. in my whole life that was stage then trains and airplanes hmm. and hotel you know it's really nice that you filled in some of the blanks about your father because i couldn't find a lot about your your father or your parents other than that you were in this military family and in oh, fact in if fact, i send you with the pictures of my father you would fall in love well, it's, it was so the fact that you would talk about, I'm sure he was handsome. Of course, you're so handsome. But, but the fact that you talk about him being an artist, 
I was actually thinking, I was wondering about your relationship with him because I was thinking you were going into the arts and that would be somehow antithetical or in stark contrast to a military life and that you would be rebelling somehow. So, so his military side existed alongside being an artistic person. Would that be correct? Yeah, definitely. And that means uh, my father's job was military, but not his uh, uh, his passion uh, or his uh, hobby was uh, art, poetry, uh, literature, music. Uh, he was pushed to be military because he has this opportunity uh, opportunity. Uh, to to do to be and being military in Iran at that age was really a beautiful job because the the king was military as well but his real deep wishes was really uh, art that was why even as a military we had a artistic life and he he knew perfectly I will finish being artist. He knew it. Oh, really? And, and you knew it too? I was going to say, I mean, if you, did you, you knew this? Uh, I mean, because I was wondering if that sense of what you're going to be doing in, in, in your life as an artist, as a dancer, would have come later when you go to France. So even when you're back in Iran as a kid, you know that you're going to become an artist and your father knows that too? Absolutely. Everybody knows because wow. I couldn't do anything else. I, I, I was a student in, in medicine, uh, but I couldn't be a doctor. That's impossible for me. To doing something regularly and doing uh, like a repetitive uh, mo- uh, things uh, every day, uh, every morning at the same time, the same hour, uh, waking up, going to the work, doing the same job, doing the routine uh, things. It's impossible for me. I can't. It's not my character. That makes a lot of sense, and it's a, and it and it also follows logically uh, that you were a, this artistic a, as a kid, and that you knew the path, even though there wasn't a lot of blueprints for the kind of path you end up taking. Shahrukh, I have to ask you: when the revolution happened, uh, your dad was thrown in jail. I can only wow. imagine that had an effect on you. What What do you remember about that time? Mm, yeah, I was. Uh 11 when the revolution uh, uh, happened in Iran and immediately my my daddy was in jail for six years and then uh, we were in uh, we came to France and he came to France that destruction of the family and the uh, helped me maybe helped me a lot to uh, to be more uh, like independent uh, and uh, and starting my life as I wish to do it mm. and without being uh, under pressure of the family's wishes of course they they would love me uh, being a doctor or uh, I don't know whatever engineer like all pa- Persian parents uh, but they did not had any choice anymore, any information about what I am doing. I did whatever I felt good to do, and nobody was behind me to push me to something else because my mother was occupied by her own story and my family story, and my father was in jail, and after when he left, the jail and came to um, uh, France, he was preoccupied by his own problems. So uh, uh, there, there was nobody who could direct me to somewhere else. You had to grow up pretty fast. Yeah. And so, and I chose to, to go to the University of Art and uh, I became a, a, a actor maybe because of this chance you know that was like an accident because i was in a fantastic course of uh, greek mythology when i met ariane nushkin and and uh, directly i passed from the university to to work and i never did 
anything else. Yeah, just the, w- one more question, though, about being in Iran. I mean, just to excavate it a little bit. You, so where were you when the revolution happened? Were you still in Esfahan or were you in Tehran? No, no, we were in Kermashah. Yeah. yeah. My, my daddy was the, the uh, governor, the military governor of uh, Kermashah, and uh, the, the city was in the uh, martial law. And, so, so just to uh, set the scene, this artistic, this extremely artistic little kid who is showing signs of wanting to perform and dance and be in theater and, and, uh, and who already has an allergy to suffocation, as we know. Uh, um, this 11-year-old has his, suddenly the country turns upside down and his father gets taken away. I mean, emotionally, how, how did you cope with that? You know, is um, instinct of survival for everybody is working, and uh, most of the time people survive. Uh, it's very rare when somebody can get suicide, and uh, so I had some uh, tentative of suicide, and uh, unfortunately or unfortunately, uh, that did not happen. Uh, but you didn't give and, up. You didn't start doing drugs. You didn't ruin your life. No, you, you, not you, with you, drugs. Yeah, sometimes I would. I was really uh, hopeless, uh, hopeless for the future of life. Uh, but I, I had this fortune to stay and let the time passing and. Uh, waiting for the next step right uh, now it's almost the same i i could be completely depressed uh, during the covid 19 because uh, doing nothing during a year or two years or maybe forever uh, that could be con- considered like a, a depression but uh, i don't feel like depressed at all and I'm watching uh, the time, and I'm watching the nature, uh, and, and I'm watching myself from inside, and I'm talking to myself, and I'm the first time I have conversation with my loneliness. I can hear the silence, and uh, it is not sad at all. And the time disappear in my uh, body in my mind and uh, and there is no more reality and i'm just exercising for the first time like meditation a huge mm-hmm. long meditation without no end visible and i'm enjoying it and i don't believe something will return to normal because there is no normal. I do believe in the evolution, in the permanent evolution of things. I don't believe something will return to the back, to the past life. So I'm just enjoying the present and waiting for the future without too much passion for the future, but lots of passion for now. Can I point something out to you? Yeah. I asked you a question about being 11 years old and your father being taken away to jail, and you ended up telling me about how you're doing right now. Mm, because uh, when I'm thinking uh, about my past life, uh, I, I, I think I'm losing my time. Mm. Mm. The past is beautiful. I don't, I don't want to deny it. But is it really interesting for me now to analyze what I was and how I survived? You know, you've f- first of all, you when you went to France, uh, you end up having some very successful years there. You have a great resume of performance there uh, in theater and dance. Why did you end up coming to America? What, what, if, if France was so successful for Shah Rukh Moshkin Kalam, why come to the United States? 
You know, first of all, uh, there was an accident. Accidents uh, happen all the time uh, in your life, but sometimes you don't watch them like a happy accident and you don't seize the time, seize the good accident. And I most of the time seized always the beautiful uh, accident in my life. One of them was when I was performing six years ago uh, with Hamed Nikpe in the United States. And I met somebody and I started a love story. And uh, that happened that uh, we get married because I had to come back so often in the United States. I couldn't do this going back all the time as a tourist. It was not easy. So we get married and uh, I had more performances in the United States than, than France. Um, somehow I abandoned uh, my life style, my works, my uh, artistic life in France and Europe. And I discovered another word, another uh, um, opportunity and the possibility to perform for people here. And I did lots of performances. Last year, I was like, I never have worked as much as last year in the United States. So many different kind of performances, dance, uh, theater, poetry, reading, uh, analyzing uh, literature and uh, talking and I did so 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 much and uh, my my lifestyle was beautiful and rich in the United States even for my love story which ended in the very bad uh, end uh, of divorce and lots of uh, you know drama uh, but I was in the middle of the decision to going to the next step of my life, maybe next immigration uh, for the fourth or for fifth uh, times uh, immigration, uh, maybe going back to Europe, maybe going back, going somewhere else, but not to France. And so uh, the corona uh, happened and I'm stuck right now in the United States without knowing if I can stay here. I don't know where, uh, where and when uh, I can be and uh, how. I don't know anything. I would love to keep my mind in the prison and not going too far. Yeah. Let me ask you about your identity in terms of where you're, where you exist. Not necessarily just physically, but in terms of how you identify with where you exist. Uh, because you've just talked about being in the United States. Of course, you spent many years in France. You were a kid in, in, in Iran. You have said repeatedly over the, over the years that your dance and creative works, you mentioned it earlier in this interview, are inspired by your Persian heritage. You've said, I came to realize the importance of my roots, my heritage being Iranian after I left Iran. But Shah Rukh, you've also said that you don't really belong anywhere and that you're a citizen of the world. So square those two things for me. Are they at odds with each other? No, not at all. Because, you know, uh, I cannot deny the part of my my being during 13, 15 years made by Persian culture, especially, uh, you know, your childhood do uh, like more than... 80% of your being is made during the first eight years of your life. And you cannot deny it. Even if you pass after age of eight to United States or somewhere else, you can never deny your origin being during this eight first years of your life. Is that life. right? It's the first eight years? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. 80% of your of your character and uh, everything is made during your first seven, eight years of your life. So uh, as I know who I am and how how much I spend in you know, Iran with my parents, with my language and with my culture, 
I cannot deny it. Even if I grew up for my uh, intelligent being, for, for my development of my evolution and uh, uh, being an adult in France, but I, I can't uh, deny my, my past life. So instead of just forget it, I use it because it's opportunity to have a plus. But it's having not, it's, the plus. Yeah, it's not just that you use it. I mean, you are you are one of the ambassadors of Persian culture, quite frankly, or, you know, around the world. Uh, so uh, but that's a very vital role culturally that you're playing in the diaspora. And, and I suppose it would be appropriate to ask you, if anyone, right, what, what do you think it means to be Iranian? What does it mean to you? You know, you know there is lots of uh, talk about that. What is the identity? We, we call that hoviat. Hoviat, it's a huge question. What is your hoviat? What is your identity? Is that only the, uh, the, the place of birth? Or it's only your language? Or it's only your family? Your background? Or your present? Or your wishes? Your ambition, but you're answering your, a question. You're answering my question with questions. I'm asking you. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. What I'm it not, means I, to you to I'm be not, Iranian? I, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not asking you. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I'm just giving you my answer. Okay. Uh, uh, that 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 means for me being Iranian or being uh, French or being American doesn't change. It's changing just a title in my. Uh, pepper uh, uh, in my uh, cards in my uh, ID. This is not my identity. My identity is Sharak Mushingalam, who is unique. You cannot copy Sharak Mushingalam twice, as you cannot copy uh, Jean Romeshi. There is only one. So, what is my culture? What is my domination of cultural languages? I don't know. I'm a mixture of all this. I'm not more Iranian than other Iranian. I'm not less Iranian than other Iranian. I'm not more French than other French or less or whatever. But if a, I, I understand, but if a, if a Swedish person or if, a, if somebody walks up to you in San Francisco who knows nothing about Iranians or Persians and says, what is it? What does it mean to be Iranian? What 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 can you tell me about being Persian? What would be the first thing that would come to mind? I, it is. I'm sorry, but it is not a good question. Maybe it's a good question for your other clients, but not for me because <laughs> I can't give you an answer, correct answer. Okay. What is the meaning of being Persian? That is not a question, a good question for me because I don't ha I don't have any answer for that. Okay, how I to understand. Be, how, what, what is being? Isn't this where you're supposed to? Say, in the, isn't this where you're supposed to say? I don't. I didn't hear the question. I think we got cut off. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's interesting to keep it. It's interesting, but I don't. I don't have answer to okay, all the no questions problem. of the world. No problem. Let me just end with a couple of questions about where you're, where you're doing right now and who you are right now. Um, because you've alluded to a couple of times in this interview, uh, this COVID period being a time of reflection and, and doing some um, meditation. And I can only think that this for someone like Shah Rukh Mashin Alam, who I've, I've, I've always known is running around and is doing so many different things and is, is busy, you know, uh, has this big personality that either you've always been putting that on and this and you get to be you now for this period or that is you and you've created this 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 new moment is a chance to reflect and slow down and and take stock what have the last few months been like for you yeah the, the moment of reflection reflection about life about my life about what i am and how happy I am to be and not to be something else. And this question is not anymore exist. Being or not being is not anymore a question. It is a feeling. I can feel it. I can feel be or not to be immediately at the same time. And this is the most... Uh, uh, beautiful fruit I got 
thanks to this moment of reflection in my life, maybe the the only moment. Do you worry about business? Do you worry about how to make ends meet, how making money? I'm not worried at all. I, I know it's not good because instinct of survival, survival of the human should be like an alarm to be worried about the future, but I'm not. Maybe I realize that I, I am an animal more than human being. The crow. A crow. A crow is not worry because there is always food and somewhere to fly and having safe life. It sounds like you're in a pretty good place, Aziz. You're, you're, uh, you're, 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 this pause is, is good for you. you. You talked a bit about the time moving on, which also um, – the the pretext of time or the, the the implication can sometimes be aging. Do you are you someone who a lot of the work that you've done over the years is highly physical work? It's acrobatic at times. Do you are you someone who fears getting older? How do you feel about getting older? Fear is really like being worried. I'm not. Uh, I don't have any kind of fear uh, about anything right now, and. Uh, being older, uh, because you use uh, older like a negative word, but I'm using aging as a positive thing. I'm aging, that means I get mature, and maturity was my wishes from all my ages. Mm. And I was always uh, thinking, how is possible to be a pire khirad? Pire khirad is the the highest level of being and an RF is, is is Sufi and in the same time pure means aged or old yes. but uh, being uh, uh, and reaching this uh, level of being in Erfan in mysticism is the top of the top that means being the old with the white hair and now I'm reaching this understanding of last steps of my life and I'm enjoying this where do you think your creative journey will go from here I think that my creative journey will be more inside and deeply inside and without being concerned about my uh, appearance and superficial things. Uh, superficiality is less and less interesting for me. And I'm trying to find myself from my deep, deep inside. Maybe less performances then in the future? Maybe any performances for the rest of my life. Sorry, maybe you mean maybe you wouldn't perform again at all? Maybe, yeah. Everything is possible. Wow, this period has had a profound impact on you. Yeah, maybe it's uh, temporary. Maybe it's changing tomorrow. But I don't know anything about tomorrow. That's why I'm not thinking about tomorrow. So right now, when you ask me what is right now, I'm just giving you the answer of what I am feeling right now. I'm enjoying right now to do nothing else than thinking. And it's enough. Shah Ruch, I am so thankful for all of this time, for sharing, for the exchange of emotions that, um, uh, that don't just happen between you and your audiences, but I feel like might have happened between uh, us during this interview. And I, I, I'm very much uh, appreciative of it. Thank you for the time. Um, thank you for your reflections. And uh, I can't wait to see you before the, when this COVID stuff is over with. I love you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time and for your energy and for your positive uh, way just pushed me to do it. I know it's important and I know it's interesting for me, for others, and maybe for you. Maybe for you, the less. 
but uh, for <laughs> others, <may. laughs> on the contrary, yeah. I, it was the most interesting for me. Merci and take care of yourself. God bless. I love you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. The actor, dancer, choreographer, director extraordinaire, Shah Rukh Mushkin Galam, he joined us from San Francisco, California today. little sound of uh, a song called Crown. That's by a guy named Danny Asadi, the Wonder Boy, the Wonder Kid from uh, California. Uh, he's in L.A. now. He actually grew up in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, Danny is uh, the pioneer of something, even though he's in his early 20s, of something called Persian trap music. It's electronic and hip-hop music combined with uh, these Persian-Iranian sounds. Of course, uh, Danny's background is Iranian. Uh, Danny Asadi... We've got him coming on the show on Monday, right, Chaya? Yes, true. Uh, I'm very excited about that, and uh, I really love what he does. Danny Asadi coming up on Monday. Uh, Jane Lewison, who is the founder and the, art, the director of something called the Golestan Project. The Golaha Project and the Golestan Project, archiving Persian culture in different ways. Um, she will also be joining us in the coming days on Rook and uh, much more. We'll get to all of that. The The, the Thursday team has reconvened post Shah Rukh interview here. <laughs> Captain Reza, uh, Groovy Shaya, the fabulous Keon. I saw you through the glass laughing throughout that interview, uh, <laughs> Captain Reza. I was. It was. It was. It was a ride. <laughs> He's a. So he is. He is the singular Shah Rukh. Right. Yeah. You can't. There's only, as he says in the interview, there's only yeah. one person. I'm. There's only one Shah Rukh. That's, 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 it can be truer. No, no, like I've never heard an, an interview like that in my entire life. He's it was quite so out fascinating. There. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, I you find. I'm sorry, you go no, ahead. No, I was gonna say the moment he switched to Farsi, he became a totally different person. He's like, blah, 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 blah. yeah. <laughs> but aside from speaking fast, it's just his personality changed. Yeah. It was so interesting. I was shocked <laughs> at the fact that he doesn't drink or do drugs, and he only recently discovered oh, yeah. marijuana. I like. You I, thought he was I, a well, regular <laughs> user. <laughs> well, I've had the pleasure of watching him on stage, and uh -huh. when you watch him in action. It's like nothing like you've thinking, ever this seen. Guy this guy's tripping. guy is yeah. tripping something. <laughs> but you so know, he's amazing at his craft. He is. He has he's that, just that naturally is, yeah, that is animated. Years of <laughs> practice and, and being one of the great talents of the world. But it's true. I was surprised too, yeah, actually. I did, yeah. Something I didn't know about Shah Rukh, that he hasn't uh, he done any of that for, for almost his entire life. Yeah. Uh, Groovy Shaya, your, any, any thoughts on Shah Rukh before we get to the... Uh, <laughs> The letters. Um, I like him actually. Uh, I, I spoke with Shah Rukh while he was in Toronto uh, last year, and this is Shah Rukh. And I love, <laughs> you know, I love the thing about when you interview with people, your interview became itself. Mm -hmm. uh, his became uh, real. You know? Yes. Yeah. yeah and yeah. I and I like. Yes. And I like it. Yeah. yeah. I felt that too. I felt like we really got. Uh, Really got shot. He he wasn't manufacturing a personality no. or beca or mm. doing something. No. Actually, I've seen a couple of interviews with him uh, in the research for this, so where he's he's a little more contained. He's sitting on a set of a TV station, and he's uh, he's I mean he's very eloquent anyway. But you know he uh, this was the real Shah Rukh. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's kind of got this wild imagination, yeah. and uh, I enjoyed that. About and comes this. up with ideas on the fly too. It's just yeah, I just saw a crow right now. <laughs> 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 he's so and poetic. He wants to be a crow. Yeah. He wants yeah. to be a crow, which which actually I liked his uh, analogy of a crow. Like yeah. nobody captures a crow because better to be a crow. Uh, better uh, be a crow, a crow and free. Better to be a crow than a rasu. Than a rasu. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine him on a long, <laughs> like Roman-style, velvety couch with a long cigarette holder, <laughs> just like yeah. yes, I was watching a crow. <laughs> just makes so much sense. I don't know if he was that precious. I thought he was. He's just very <laughs> eloquent. Wow. He's very yeah. Yeah, charming. Well, it is that time. It's Thursday. The gang has convened. It is time for letters of the week.
Okay, so just to mention, we've gotten a lot of letters on the Maximini interview, but we'll get to them next week. We just have so much to get to today. Um, first, we have a... By the way, I started to write down the names. I, I actually click oh, nice. on the link and on get the, the people's names. Quick, yes, I'm know. glad people... <laughs> starting so to be appreciated no around users, here no more usernames there, there is a few but anyway <laughs> <laughs> well they don't have names listed so. Hope. on facebook we have shabnam zamani she wrote i keep learning about people and subjects familiar to me and it turns out that there are more aspects into each topic i didn't know about these episodes have widened the window into the world i thought i was familiar with so much respect and gratitude to the Rook team for digging into such interesting aspects and topics. Thank you, Rook team. Nice. Nice. Thank you, Shabna. And then on Facebook as well, we have a Nazila Rafizadeh. She wrote, hi to all my lovely Rook team, especially Kion. <laughs> Kion <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> she says, Kion Jean, I'm na Nazila Rafizadeh, not Tarizadeh, oh like you mentioned God. in episode. <laughs> 45. Shaya, where were you? You didn't correct me that day. <laughs> Wait a second. So she, you mangled her name yeah. <laughs> and she says, especially she and she loves you for it. This is the... I, I, but you know what's interesting? She mangled her name and came up with a new name. A new name. That <laughs> actually is a... She Tally called her Tappy Zodé. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds better, no? It, it is <laughs> a name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, she goes on saying, anyway, I listened to each episode of Rook two to three times without getting bored and thinking deeply about every question and answer. You have opened a new window in front of my eyes. I've learned lots of things that I've never thought about before. Each guest has their own unique story and each story has its own valuable lessons. Thanks, Gian, Kion, Shaya, Reza, and all the Rook crew for the amazing program. It's like we're the Brady Naz Bunch. Nazila, Tarizade slash Rafizade. It's Rafizade. Thank you. Oh, moving on, we uh, so on episode forty-five this week. We or no, sorry, last week we had an interview. We had interviews with human rights activist Hadi Raimi, legendary writer and activist Sharnoush Parsipur, and finally screenwriter and director Cyrus Nor Nor Nauruste. 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 Damn it! I'll never get good at these pronunciations. Nauruste. Nauruste. Oh, a few people wrote on that specific episode. Episode. Do you practice the pronunciation before we go on air? I try to. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, it's not wondering. pronounced how it's written sometimes. It's like now Raste, yeah. but it's no Raste. And you can't like pass Shia in the hallway and ask him then? <laughs> he's always I'm busy. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> you guys keep, he's, he's unapproachable. Keep I know, he's difficult. things yeah. to work on. Like I already have the username's <laughs> names one, written one down. One step at a time. She's, yeah. she's yeah. reading the All names right. now. I'm so. doing my best here. <laughs> <laughs> well, on YouTube, we have Behruz Jalali wrote, Greetings, Gian. Shahnoush is one of the most Rook guests you've had on your great program so far. That's true. Very she was true. very yeah. forthcoming. Yeah. yeah. I loved it. Very you know where she stands. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then we have Mojgan Parsi. She wrote, great pleasure to know Cyrus Noroste. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, could uh, you, yeah? could you uh, repeat five times no raste? No raste. No uh -huh. raste. Uh -huh. No raste. Uh -huh. No raste. All right. No raste. Yeah, thank you. All right. There we go. Thank you, Professor. By the way, Shia, uh, yeah. Shia is uh, does not shy from asking for help uh, in speaking yeah. English too. Yeah. Sometimes I correct him. No, I appreciate when, it. Yeah. yeah. Today he said, uh, uh, "What did you say today?" He say he I, said, "I find a music." I find a music, and I said, "Actually, you found a piece of music, or you found some, some music. music." We don't say Aww. a music. Yeah. yeah, you know what I. So him? he's not just being. Uh, I, I just don't want you to feel he's being patronizing well, towards you. I actually you. taught him he's, something today. What did you teach? He's him? like, yes. "How are you, Ken?" I said, "I have woman pains today." He's like, "What is woman pain?" And I said, <laughs> "You see, Shia, there comes a time in a girl's life." <laughs> Kian, you taught us all. That. We do. I like yes. how uh, Keon's impression of Shia sounds Russian. What is this? <laughs> this I am woman. from Leningrad. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, women pain? Well, Shia, is that you? Uh, yes, I come from Moscow. What? Shia? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. W's are pronounced. She is experiencing <laughs> the women, women, women pain. <laughs> All right. So All right, moving right, on. Right. On Facebook, we have Rose Morsh. Well, dear Jian, I've been following your podcast from the beginning. I have to be very honest. Okay. Some episodes I truly loved, but today's episode was one of my favorites. You have introduced so many beautiful people to me who are activists empowering humanity. 
You are beyond talented and you have left me in awe. Oh. Thank you for showing us the hidden gems of our culture. That sounds like a letter of the week to me. <laughs> you would think, but no. <laughs> Came close. I like when they compliment me, they're yeah. never the letter I of the know, week. Letter just of the week. Shut Keons, us but it's like, oh, Keon June, especially <laughs> you, June. even though you even said my name was Newton Davis and it's actually <laughs> Sally Zadeh. Even though you butchered my name like crazy, but I still love you uh, so much. Uh-huh. I mean, she came a close Thank second. Thank you to Rose Morsh. Rose I appreciate Morsh. that. That was beautifully said. <laughs> <laughs> on Instagram we have Marzia Hadi 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 Hadi. You see, I wrote, I didn't write down the username. I actually clicked on her and got yeah. the name, and I still can't pronounce. How do you pronounce the last? Hi, how do you write the last Hadi. name? Marzia H A D E I. Hadi. 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 Yes, Hadi. Hadi. Marzia Hadi. Darim Hadi. No. Maybe Hadia. 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 But H E H A D E I. E I. Hadei. Hadei. Well, it's her name, okay? Yeah. Marzia. <laughs> well, Marzia yeah. goes on saying. It's better than username 643 or whatever you would have called her last week. So this is we're making That's progress. Well, you guys add new notes to every time. They're like, find new ways of things that yes. are wrong with yes. what I'm doing. Five months into the show, we've asked you to say their names. <laughs> the letters. Is well, our had note. you have done that day one, I would have taken note. Well, Marzia says, <clears throat> I absolutely. I'm going to get a Rasu in here. <laughs> yeah. Put you guys all in your place. Lock you all. you all in a room. Oh, yes. <laughs> Tomato oh. paste from Persian Plaza. All Let's right, Marzia. Are, am I ever going to say what she has yes, to say? Go for it. <laughs> she says, I absolutely agree with Jian that the movie, The Stoning of Soraya, is not against Islam or Muslim people at all. My family, who is Muslim, by the way, watched this wonderful movie a couple of years ago back in Tehran. I vividly remember the movie caused huge arguments amongst those who are both pro and against the regime. There was no interpretation of this movie being against Islam or any religion in general. The stoning of Soraya was a super sad, dark, but true story. Yeah, that's hmm. a reference to because we had Cyrus Noah still on. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's the writer director of that, um, of that film. Um, yeah, well, thank you, Marzia, for weighing in on that. Mm-hmm. There are so many opinion, opinions about that film. Mm-hmm. Have you seen it? Kayla? A long time ago. Yeah. It's just one heavy, of those heavy, heavy movies. It's very heavy to watch again. Yeah, yeah you yeah. don't want to. Yeah. Uh, even I remember seeing it at uh, the Toronto International Film Festival, and then mm-hmm. I watched it again before the Cyrus interview. Yeah. It's uh, I cried. I mean, it's really awful, difficult. It yeah. makes it more. It's a true story, and that's what yeah. you. But you know. it's also. But you know, I know the criticisms of it are you have what's the context? You know, mm. if you just put that out there, that is that the one impression people are left with of Iran, all of that. You know, but but it's it, as a film, it's it's very powerful. Yeah. It's very powerful. Yeah, it is. Uh, on Instagram as well, we have Atifa Tabish. She wrote, your real-time translating is amazing. Yep. I'm shocked. Your Farsi is excellent, Gian. Be there proud. <laughs> letter of the week. Is that the letter of the week? No. That was a good one. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Third place. That was, I was uh, trying to... Uh, I was trying to translate uh, Shahnoush when she yeah. would say words in, in Farsi. Yeah. And then I would look at Shaya to see if I had uh, translated it correctly. But yeah, yeah. It's well, charming yeah. when you speak Farsi. It's like, Merci I want to June. pat you on the back. There, there, dear. Good okay. job. That is really <laughs> patronizing. All right. And then we have Amir Ali Shams wrote on Instagram saying, Hello, Rook team. Thanks for your amazing podcast. Jian, I think it would be better if you had your conversation with Sharnus Parsipur in Farsi, like you did with Farid Zoland. Sharnus was obviously not confident in English and couldn't deliver her messages fully to the audiences. Please consider it with your future guests when they're not confident in English. Yeah, I get that point. You know, the thing is, actually, Sharnus was uh, interested in speaking in English, mm-hmm. and because she wants her works to be. Um, accessible to an English audience. And I'll tell you already as well that with Shah Rukh today, we had given him the option. Uh, I mean, we want to do the show in English because it it should be accessible to a, a wider audience than just mm-hmm. Iranians uh, who, who speak Persian. But but um, I gave that option to Shah Rukh and he wanted to speak English as well. He, mm. For him, it's novel. It's, it's let, let me do, you know, all of his interviews have been in Farsi, have mm. been in Persian. So, um, but I, I understand the point. Uh, Shahnoush is, uh, would would probably this something. Somebody said something interesting though. I think I can't remember if it was in our mail or somebody on our team. Which is that when you're more limited by the with the language, you're more direct. 
And with Shahnu, she, she, she was very direct in her answers. Now, she may, in her case, be that way in, in Farsi as well, in Persian as well. But uh, Persians do tend to speak in a very nuanced way sometimes. Indirect you know, way. It's indirect way, or mm. almost a, sometimes it can be a poetic way, but, yeah. but rather than just getting to the point. And <laughs> when you limit some of that vocabulary, yeah. it, they get straight to the point. And so, yeah. in a way, uh, we had somebody who was... Uh, um, volunteering and helping us out and said the best thing about the show is like everybody is being so honest because a lot of them don't speak English perfectly and so they're more honest in English and I sort of what, what do you mean by that and this is exactly what was the point that was being made yeah that's exactly. true I never yeah. thought of it no, that I way agree. yeah it's I straight to the point agree. like yeah, cut the shit <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Keon, for... <laughs> no, for the, we, it's true. We, <laughs> it is Persian's true. Persian's very a poetic language, yes, so yes. it's like, you know, you can yeah. get lost in the language sometimes. Uh, last week on episode 44, we had legendary songwriter, composer Fatty Zolan. So a lot of people continue to write on this specific episode. We have on YouTube a Negin Dusti. She wrote... This is what I call transformative journalism. Hmm. What a great interview, Gian. Hearing about the legendary Mr. Fadi Zolan's enduring fight for the copyright of his amazing music was both heart-rendering and inspiring. I kept shaking my head in disbelief. How could such a great composer be unrecognized and underappreciated both socially and materialistically? By the same token, I have no doubt that this interview and other similar stories have the power to push each and every one of us to think more critically, be more sensitive and proactive, and try to contribute to the diaspora's social and cultural progress in our own individual and unique ways. Mm. Wow. Great letter. Thank you, Nagin Dusti. I almost wish I made that the letter of the week. That was beautiful. <laughs> Speaking of the letter of the week, oh. it's time for Whoa. the letter of the week. <laughs> Oh, it's going to be some spectacular letter of the week <laughs> after all the ones you've dismissed. You know. <laughs> God, I hope somebody. I don't disappoint now. <laughs> On uh, Instagram, we have Maryam Sadiq. She wrote, Hi, thank you so much for having Farid Zoland on your show. I'm Afghan, but I love Iranian songs. And most of my favorites are composed by Farid. Even though I'm only 29 years old, I love all the songs Farid composed back in the 70s. Thank you so much for having him on your show. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. Very yeah. sweet. Yeah, that well deserved. I like that. Actually, yeah. as a letter of the day, an, an Afghan person relating to Farid and his story. Yeah. Very well done. Thank you, Kian Docht. Thank you, Gian Docht. <laughs> thank you. Um, I don't think I'm Gian Docht. No, I, I just felt like name. adding yeah. it in. Uh, thank you. That the, the letter of the week goes to Maryam Sadiq. Uh, thank you to Groovy Shia. Thank you to uh, Captain Reza. And thank you to the fabulous Kian. We'll see you next week. Uh, that is full time for Rook for today. Uh, thank you to all of you for listening and supporting. Info at rookmedia.com is where to find us. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at Rook Media, of course, on all our, our other platforms. Thank you to Arash Behzadi, Arash Behzadi, who can be found on Instagram at Arash Piano. Arash Piano, thank you to Arash for supporting this uh, episode of Rook. Thanks to Shah Rukh Mushkin Galam. Uh, and uh, we will uh, see you all on Monday with Danny Asadi. We're going to go on on some music by Sohail Nafisi, uh, sort of an apt song that Shaya has selected to go with Shah Rukh today. Thanks again. Mizun Bashi.